morning everyone again already said good morning once morning hasn't changed get up there and uh, i'm just going to pray and then we'll we'll get started gracious father thank you for this morning thank you for the fact that we could sing again we could uh come and uh, worship we can do that both here uh online and uh and I'll just give you thanks for those who, um, you know, are in a state and able to watch or, you know, have to stay at home or who are able to join in. Uh, that is a, a really wonderful thing that you've been able to create. So help us all to honour you and uh, help us to yeah, come, as we especially come to the end of the year, to reflect on the year, reflect on who you are uh, and be able to celebrate uh, just the fact that we can, we, we can worship. We can come into you with prayers and joys and sorrows, and you are there. And it's truly amazing. Praise you for it. And what we're about to do now, may you help us uh, by equipping us, challenging us, comforting us, uh, helping us to be people who draw close to you. Ask that in your precious name, Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the effects of COVID-19 has meant that, of course, a lot of the um, things that we would normally do, uh, we've had to stop or either change. Uh, travel wherever you want, gone. Slowly coming back, yay. Uh, getting together with others, that went. Yeah, slowly coming back. Yeah, that was, that was good. Uh, you know, you got a bit of a sniffle and you're not going to worry about it. That went, you know, because, you know, you get <laughs> and everyone looked at you. Um, you know, uh, hopefully that doesn't come back, you know, that, you know, that we take, take health stuff seriously still. But singing in church went. Uh, and it was quite bizarre to stand up and... You know, um, well, now we can sing. I'm thankful that they're all coming back. Most of that is all coming back. But that change wasn't necessarily a bad thing because it did give us an opportunity to ask, well, why did I used to do that? Why do I miss that? Why don't I miss that? Uh, and now as things are coming back, I think it's even more important that we ask, and think about those questions. You know, why did I miss doing that? You know, what, why, why is it I'm not missing it now? Uh, take Christmas, for instance. At one point, I was really wondering whether we would ever have a Christmas service. Um, you know, and now I, I do know that some churches are not having Christmas services because they're going, we can't quite, you know, they've made that decision months with all the COVID stuff happening that we couldn't quite handle all that. Um, we are, as I've already said. But that process actually made me think about, well, what is it a, about Christmas? What do we do at Christmas? You know, you know what, what's Christmas about? How does society treat Christmas? And I had to ask myself, have we actually lost the plot when it comes to Christmas? And I find uh, myself now, to be honest, not really wanting to do much with Christmas. Rather, I would, I want to focus on the celebration, which it is meant to be. You know, so let me explain myself. Um, it has been a bit of an ongoing joke here that, you know, uh, me saying how many days it is to the 25th of December, you know. You know I, th I think I started at about, you know, 350 or something like that, um, you know, just after last Christmas. Uh, and I noticed there's the chuckles and I noticed there's the smiles, but also notices there's a bit of the groans that come, come with that. And... You know, I theorize that's because of what Christmas has become. See, Christmas has sort of become these sort of things uh, for our society. Um, you know, it, things like presents and holidays and Christmas lights and food and shopping, travel, the stress, uh, family. Uh, sometimes the stress is because of family. Sometimes it's because of other things. But, you know, we stress about shopping for presents that may or may not be appreciated. 
we we plan who we're visiting, uh, who this year, and you know we, and sometimes that is a really complicated process. Um, you know, got to make sure we keep the family balances going there, uh, and we do a little logistics check, you know, to make sure we got have a, enough supplies like food and decorations, and also that the tree is up. You know, it, it, we really go for that. In fact, I think we tend to look more forward to Boxing Day when we can hopefully relax a bit and eat leftovers. I mean, it, it's generally fun getting together with family or most of the family. And you know, we do get to sing carols and we can feel uh, good by going to church first before getting into the rest of the day. But generally Christmas is exhausting and it's expensive. I thought, you know, I'll do the classic Google. How much will we spend on Christmas? Uh, a site said that Australians will spend $18.8 .8 billion on Christmas. Now, that's a figure that I just can't get my head around, to be perfectly honest. No, it's not each. But that's the average household will spend $1,800 on, uh, on Christmas. That's the average household. Um, roughly around there. But $18.8 billion on that. Uh, uh, we will mainly spend it on travel and presents. Uh, but we also will spend it on some decorations and we'll spend it on charity as well, was, which was interesting there in that site. We are tend to be a bit generous at Christmas. Now, the same site estimates that 5.4 million of us will rely on credit to do that. And even if those figures are way over exaggerated, that's still huge amounts. And as I was thinking about it, for those that this is what Christmas is all about, I say go for it. Enjoy it. Um, I want to acknowledge that Christmas has been hijacked by commercialism. You know, I just don't want to do this anymore. Um, I'm not anti-Christmas, by the way. Uh, for I realise for many, uh, this is the best that it's going to get. But rather, I want something that's simpler and more valuable. I really want it. I do. I want it. Yeah. Oh, I want to celebrate the birth of a saviour that I get together as family, both biological and my spiritual brothers and sisters in Christ, to celebrate Christ Jesus' birth. I'm not really interested in the debate about, you know, is the 25th of December his actual birthday or, or not? I just want to celebrate that the light of the world has come into the world, been born. And I want to come to church on the 25th of December and be it be the highlight of my day, something I look forward to and something I value afterwards, not just something I have to do. You know, I, I, I want to revel in the amazing miracle that took place over 2,000 years ago. Now, I noticed I just said a lot of, as I wrote that, I said, oh, I've said a lot of I wants. Yet I really would like all of us to recapture the amazement of Jesus' birth. Um, one of the reasons I think Christmas has become more a commercial event rather than the celebration is because we've sort of become um, dull to how miraculous the event was and what happened. Uh, as uh, you know, Perry, I think, mentioned that, you know, for many of us, we've heard it so many times. Or was it Lois? I couldn't remember. Anyway, it was mentioned. I went, oh, yes, that's in my message. Um, for some, you've heard it for more than half a century. You know, this story that Jesus was born is actually old news. Yep, we know that. Uh, we've read it time after time. And every Christmas time, preachers come along and they preach about it like today. And we become a little bit numb to it. We can I'm not saying we have, but we can. But are we struck with awe by what happened? You know, when you think about it, the angels' visitations, fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, uh, the closeness of Jesus actually being killed 
uh, you know, the, the response of strangers to what was happening. It's an amazing event. It's a, it's a miraculous event. It's a miracle that changed the universe, not just the world. So John says the word, Jesus, became human and made his home among us, his creation. Think about the announcement of Jesus' birth. How amazing, how miraculous that was. Luke records that uh, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, uh, which is a whole nother miracle in all itself. I mean, a single income, no kids, family, uh, sink, um, who are old, are suddenly going to have a kid. His name is, of course, going to be John the Baptist. And Luke says, well, when Elizabeth was six months pregnant, uh, at that time, God sends the angel Gabriel to a place called Nazareth. And since you probably wouldn't have a clue where Nazareth is, it's in Galilee. You know, because Luke's writing to an audience and it would have been like, yeah, where's, where's Nazareth? Well, it's in Galilee. You probably know the region. Actually, they, they've dug around that area where the town of Nazareth uh, was. And apparently it's a small settlement. Never been there myself. Small settlement, uh, earthly, earthen dwellings. It had no political importance. Uh, it... it did have a you know a thriving population. They estimate probably a maximum of about 500 people. Um, dealt with, produced wheat and wine and oil and fruit and honey and millet. And uh, it was actually only about six k's from a, a major showcase city. So you know it's sort of like you know how narrow is an outer suburb of Vincennia. You know it you know it was sort of like kind of like that. Um, so it, it had a, there was a lot of the Hellenistic contact and so forth and Jewish contact going on there. So anyway, God sends an angel, this incredibly powerful being on a message run. You know, he says, hey, Gabriel, yeah, Lord, I've got a job for you. You're going to be a runner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I'm going to send you to a specific individual in an obscure place. And we are told that he was sent to a young woman of maritable age uh, who had not had any sexual intercourse. Uh, and we know that her name is Mary. We are told that she's engaged to a man named Joseph, who is a descendant of King David, uh, though at this stage he hadn't taken Mary to his house. And then something amazing happens. Uh, one of the things you've got to remember about sort of Jewish culture, it was normally taboo for a man to greet uh, an unknown woman in Judaism. You know, um, and to approach and greet an engaged woman could have been seen as a challenge to the fiancé's sort of authority. Uh, you know, if you wanted to tick off the fiancé, you would go talk to the, the woman he was engaged to and going, I don't care who you are. You know, it's, well, you know, here's, here's Gabriel's mission is actually to go uh, inform this unmarried, um, ineligible young woman, because she is engaged in this insignificant village, that she will bear a child, uh, which is going to be filled with so many social obstacles. And so Gabriel addresses her in quite amazing ways. I mean, we read it in English and we go, oh, yeah. You know, he's, he says, greetings, favoured woman. The Lord is with you. Now, we've read that probably. Now, how many times? It, but there's nothing like this, actually, in Scripture. This is the first instance in Scripture of an angel showing some reverence to a human being. It, the greeting word was a, a standard greeting, uh, customary Greek greeting, um, but the word highly favoured actually only occurs here in Ephesians 1. Uh, one six, if you really want to go look it up. This second word is actually derived from uh, the Greek word for grace. And of course, in the New Testament, grace is reserved solely for divine acts. And it carries the sense, you have been favoured with grace. See, Mary hasn't earned God's favour. 
And in this unusual address and unusual visitation, she's receiving God's predetermined blessing. And the assurance, the Lord is with you, is a declaration to Mary uh, and provides Mary with a significant fact. God is with me. You know, sometimes we might ask, God, are you there or not? She's been told, God is with you. Yeah, she's the recipient of God's unexpected, undeserved, overwhelming grace and presence. Like virtually all who have an angelic visitation, Mary is confused and a bit disturbed. Yeah, she's, she was having really trouble, um, you know, because she's trying to figure out what in the world is this, does this angel mean? I mean, she probably would have known her Old Testament pretty well, probably better than maybe we know ours, uh, and she would have known angels having turned up at different times. Uh, and I love how Mary, you know, in this situation, has heard God speak into her life, and she doesn't instantly get it. Uh, she is wrestling with what has been said. You know, like, what in Mary's circumstance is favourable? You know, why is God with her? Uh, you know, someone who seems so unlikely and unimportant that God would favour them. It's confusing. So Gabriel resorts to Angel Visitation 101 and says, do not be afraid. Which I might say, <laughs> I personally think is a perfectly natural response when, when something incredibly powerful turns up at your place. You know, um, like, yeah, people say, oh, I'd love to see an angel. I'm going, I'm not too sure I want to because it'd be scary. And once again, Gabriel tells Mary she's the re receiver of God's grace and then goes on to tell her that she'll conceive and give birth to a son. And then, this is an amazing thing, tell her that she, not Joseph, she will name the child. You know, it was, the, in the ceremony, it was the guy who gave the name to the child. And you know, she's going to do that. Whoa. So, so for Jewish, you know, people hearing this and reading about this, and even in Roman culture, what? What? She's going to name the child? And then he goes on, he says, I'm going to tell you five things about your boy. Just so you know. He says, first, he is going to be very great. Uh, interestingly, when Gabriel turned up with Elizabeth and Zachariah, he said that uh, their son would be very great in the eyes of the Lord. Here, Jesus' greatness is unqualified. He is going to be very great. And we know that. We're, we're, we're fortunate because we, we're looking back to Mary's life and we know how great Jesus is. This is going to be very great. He would be called the Son of the Most High. The Most High was an exclusive name for the one true God. And, you know, and so it's emphasizing his majesty and supremacy overall. Uh, the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. You know, so he's royalty. You know, he's from a royal line. He's going to be given the throne of his ancestor, fulfilling God's promise to King David back in 2 Samuel 7. And then here it gets really interesting. He will be an eternal ruler. He will reign over Israel forever. And forever. And his kingdom which, amazingly enough, we are part of, by the way. There's another miracle in itself. It will never end. Can you imagine Mary at this moment going, hang on, I'm still getting around the blessed part. You know, and you're telling my book, it's going to be great, and he's going to be the son of the most high, and he's, going to, you know, he's going to have King David's, you know, and, and, and reign, and, you know, Mary, not surprisingly, is not sort of comforted by all of this. 
In fact, Gabriel's sort of announcement seems to heighten her confusion and being, you know, being perplexed about what's going on. And like all, all mortals, she's trying to understand things from a human perspective and human reality and human possibility. She knows that children cannot be conceived apart from sexual intercourse and that in Israel, uh, they ought not to be conceived outside of marriage. And as an unmarried woman who has not had sex, Mary seems to take exception to God's, uh, to Gabriel's announcement. You know, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. Literally, I, I have not known a man. You know, one of the things Mary is, seems to be struggling with is that God is saying something that seems to go against God's own rules. Well, Gabriel comes along and addresses directly uh, in explaining how God is not going to be inconsistent here. He says quite clearly, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. This is amazing, that's you know, amazing concept. You know, the Holy Spirit coming upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Wow. So the baby to be born will be holy and he'll be called the son of God. It's like Gabriel is saying, the most high is going to do a miracle in you, something never done before or since for that matter, a miracle that will change everything. It's going to be a miracle that will turn your world upside down, Joseph's world upside down. It's going to shake Israel. It's going to overcome the Roman empire. It's going to be unstoppable across the world uh, and, and, you know, and it will challenge and turn the world, the, the lives of people in a place called Jervis Bay upside down. God is going to do such a miracle in you. And if you're wondering if all that is possible, let me tell you that your relative Elizabeth, you know, the, the old lady married to the priest Zachariah, who everyone thought was unable to have children, she is six months pregnant. Booyah! Okay, so Gabriel probably wouldn't have gone, booyah. But he tells her, this is how this is going to happen, that God is going to do this. And then he says, of course, for the word of God will never fail. God has said it will happen. Nothing is impossible for God. So believe it, Mary. Which he does. In an amazing act of faith, when logic can't put it all together, Mary surrenders herself completely to God's will. Despite her confused state, she chooses to trust in God's grace. Despite the very real possibility of being ostracized for becoming pregnant outside of marriage, such as maybe Joseph breaking off the engagement, you know that nearly happened, or being cast out of her home, she trusted God. She trusted God. She trusted God. And she responds like no one else has in a similar situation. She receives God's word with trust and she says, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. On that confession, Gabriel leaves. It's amazing to think, isn't it, that uh, her son would later say the words, Father, if you're willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. She's been announced, that's been announced to her, that's been told to her. We're told that a few days later, uh, she went to visit her cousin. So this is a few days after the announcement. When she greeted her cousin, uh, her cousin, I think it's a relative, I shouldn't say cousin, relative, uh, at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. 
and she, Elizabeth gave a gr cry, explained to Mary, God has blessed you above all women and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? And I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what he said. Imagine the, you know, the mind of Mary just at this moment. I just got an angel visitation a couple of days ago to tell me that I'm going to have a child. And now, you know, my cousin, is, my relative has said, you and your child are blessed. I'm definitely having a child. This is truly epic what happened that day. Well, it was because of this miracle that you and I get the amazing privilege of becoming part of God's family. All because of Jesus, born of the Holy Spirit and of a young lady who trusted God named Mary. We have so much to be thankful for and so much we can celebrate at this time of year when we remember the miracle of Jesus' birth and what that means for us. I want to ask. I'm going to ask. I said, I want to. I actually am going to ask. How about we do a little bit less Christmas this year? and do a lot more celebration this year. How about we make it the focus that we're celebrating the birth of our Lord and Saviour? Let's have a happy birth day this year. Yeah, the other stuff, that's there. That's going to be part of what's probably happened already. But let's not make that the focus and remind ourselves and family and friends, yep, it's a happy birthday, the Lord Jesus. Actually, just on a little minor note, I thought, you know, when you say Merry Christmas to someone, I'm waiting for someone to say, oh, we don't say Merry Christmas. And I'm just going to say, well, happy birthday then. because it's meant to be a celebration of the birth of Jesus. It's a miracle, folks. It's an incredible, amazing miracle that we get to take in and be blessed from. Let's not let commercialism rob us of the joy of the miracle. Let's pray. Lord, once again, looking at your word, which I've read a number of times before, and to thank you for the reminder that this is such an incredible and amazing event. Uh, thank you for Mary, who's who got to the point of just saying, I'm, just, I'm going to trust you, God. I trust you. Um, it, you're God. I trust you. And because of that, nine months later, our Saviour is born. And because of that, eventually you'll go to the cross and die for us and, be, and pay the price for our sins. You will rise again. You'll commission your people. And just like God sent Gabriel, you're going to send your disciples to go into all the world to make more disciples and telling them all about the truths of who you are. And that eventually it's led to us here today. What a miracle to think that all of that could happen. So give us a heart of celebration. Uh, help us to be wise in navigating the Christmas, but to not lose sight of the celebration of your birth. Thank you. Just thank you that we can. We can say, wow. our Saviour 
came into the world. That is awesome. I just want to praise you for it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.